Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. Now this week I'm going to be looking at sci-fi in British television and its evolution over the years. But before we get into that, let's roll those titles. Now sci-fi in British television goes back a very long way, longer than most other countries that have sci-fi. It goes back way into the 40s even, with adaptations such as 1984 and War of the Worlds. But I think the most significant factor in British sci-fi television is of course Doctor Who. Now Doctor Who came about when Sidney Newman moved over to the BBC and pitched his show in 1963. It was groundbreaking and at the time it was more of an educational show trying to teach people about science, mostly children as well. It only became a little bit more sci-fi-esque when sort of aliens and the Daleks started to get introduced. But up until that point, it was things in history and things about science in the real world. Now what makes Doctor Who fantastic isn't its high budget. It's never been one of those big blockbuster high budget shows until recently. What makes it amazing is its heart. Now, each one of its stories is fantastically crafted by fantastic writers over many, many years of the show running. And it never really relies on amazing special effects or anything to tell the story, up until, again, much more recently. Of course, Doctor Who is an institution of British television. It's basically completely synonymous with British culture, as is made reference to in Community, when they basically boil down British television to either things like Downton Abbey or things like Doctor Who. Now, of course, because Doctor Who's been running basically since sci-fi has been on television and still runs to this day, with, I mean, only a small pause during the 90s where we only had the TV movie, it could just be the history of television in sci-fi could just be Doctor Who. And there is a good case to say that that is where most of it comes from. However, there is a lot more to British television in sci-fi than just Doctor Who. It just cannot be ignored, however. Even with its revival in 2005, all it did was cement its place in British culture, adding many more established thespians into its ranks, many amazing writers and a lot of breakout stars that made their name in Doctor Who before moving on to Greener Pastures. But as I mentioned, it's not the only show that really defines British sci-fi. There's, I think, two more at least in the 20th century that really typify the genre. The first of which is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which began in 1981. Now, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy TV series on the BBC is based on the radio show that was also broadcast on the BBC, which in itself was based on the Douglas Adams series of books. Now, Hitchhikers does a lot of what Doctor Who does. It has the sort of space exploration aspects. It has this sort of really sort of rough and ready feel to it as well. It's, again, it feels a very low budget at the same time, but also it has this sort of grandeur. It has this sort of amazing scope to it. And I think it really achieves this really well. The other thing as well about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is it tells a fantastic story. Now, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has a lot of things going for it. It's a really fantastic piece of British sci-fi. The only thing that I think it gets a lot of unfair criticism is the film that was based on it. Now, I think the film is in itself quite charming as well. It has a lot of good moments and it is quite funny. The only thing is it doesn't really live up to the TV series, but I just think that's a compliment to this TV series. It set a really strong precedent for what this property should be and for what British sci-fi should be in general. Now, the other significant show that I want to talk about is Red Dwarf. Now, Red Dwarf is probably my favourite TV show of all time. I just absolutely love it. I have a large collection of the VHS tapes and I've probably watched them so much that the tape itself has actually run out. In fact, there's one episode, Gunman of the Apocalypse from season six, that me and my brother can basically recite all the lines to. A little bit sad, I know, but I just love Red Dwarf. Now, the best thing about Red Dwarf, really, is its characters. It does a lot of things well, again, that Doctor Who and Hitchhikers did before it. It has, again, this kind of low-budget feel, although it also brings the sort of Star Wars factor of the... It's a really lived-in universe. You can tell that it's not a sort of high-gloss, sort of over-the-top, really futuristic world. It's kind of... 
almost attainable. It's something that you could imagine actually happening, even though they're in a spaceship. Now, of course, Red Dwarf really has to rely on its characters because the premise of the show is that they're marooned three million years into deep space. So, of course, it only has this sort of finite core of characters with very rare introductions of other people coming into that. Now, the show has run for 12 series and also a television film. In fact, it also had another kind of television film, but that counts as one of the series. I think season nine was the Back to Earth special, which, okay, let's not talk about that one. However, the rest of Red Dwarf really focuses on these characters and it does them justice really well. What it does fantastically is it really explores all of their backstories. They all have feasible, believable backstories. Well, I mean, Dave Lister is his own dad, but it makes sense in the context of the episode. Not only that, they all have clear motivations and most importantly of all, they all have very clear and very humanizing flaws. I think what makes Red Dwarf fantastic is the sort of interaction between these characters. They know each other fantastically and we know them really well. And what really makes this good sci-fi is that we're not focusing amazingly on those plots, although they are essential to Red Dwarf as well. All of the highbrow concepts that they come up with and a lot of the lowbrow concepts that they also come up with are all explored fantastically and it's because we have this core unit of characters that we really like and that we really want to see how they deal with these situations. It's a fantastic example of British television in general, let alone British sci-fi. And I think it should be held up there in the same regard as Doctor Who when talking about British sort of pedigree in this genre. I could go on for a whole video talking about Red Dwarf and I probably will at some point, but for now I'm gonna leave it there. And that's because I want to move on to what I think is the sort of more modern era of British sci-fi. Now, on the turn of the 21st century, British sci-fi took a very different turn itself. It went from being this over-the-top, eccentric kind of ex space exploration thing to being a lot more dark and gritty. That can be exemplified even with the modern revival of Doctor Who, which took a much more grounded approach to the source material. The only other thing that I would say is that a lot of the series sort of don't really go sci-fi in the sort of concept that you would think that they would. It's not all about spaceships and it's not all about space. But what it does instead is it takes weird sort of almost dystopian kind of ideas and kind of modern oddities of, of the world. I think a great example of this is uh, Ashes to Ashes and Life on Mars. Now these two shows are basically one in the same. They follow the major cast of characters, however, just the main character changes between them. Now what these shows are is a sort of modern police officer who, uh, because of an accident, goes back in time and is now in the 80s in a sort of very typical 80s police show. However, there's this weird element of they are out of place and they are out of time. I think Ashes to Ashes and Life on Mars are both fantastic examples of British sci-fi because it's not necessarily sci-fi. It has a few of those aspects, but really it's telling a completely different story and it's just giving us this framework. What it does magnificently is it takes the modern world and makes us relate to the 1980s. And I know that there's a lot of people who obviously will remember the 1980s. I'm not saying that it was a time way in the past that no one could possibly remember. But what it does really well is it brings the modern world and connects it to it. So even people who weren't alive in the 1980s can get a bit of a feel from it from a person who's experienced the modern life. I think that this is a fantastic example of British sci-fi and there's a lot more just like it that I think really exemplify the genre. Another good example is Misfits. Now I've talked about Misfits a little bit before in my Team Titans video. The link to that is up in the cards. But however, what I want to talk about this time with Misfits is the exact kind of thing that I spoke about with Ashes to Ashes and Life on Mars. And that's the fact that it's a show that has this sci-fi concept where these sort of Asbo sort of young adults and teenagers who end up with superpowers because of a freak storm. Now, what's interesting about Misfits is it never really fully relies upon this concept. And it, Again, it does. Sometimes it does go into really comic book-esque storylines. 
However, that's not what drives the show. What drives the show is the realism of the characters, the teen drama and everything that comes out of Misfits. Although the superpowers do play a big part, and obviously they do because otherwise what's the point in having them? The thing that this show does really well is it sort of humanises these powers and makes them a real aspect of society. It makes it so that sort of everyone is acutely aware of them, even if they're not like, you know, they're not the mainstream. It's not something that everyone necessarily has, like an eye colour or a hair colour, but it is something that a lot of people, especially in this area, do share. And it becomes a part of their community and a part of their society. I think, again, this is a fantastic example of British sci-fi, although you might not necessarily call it sci-fi because it does stray into the sort of comic book kind of genre. I think Misfits is a fantastic example, and again, it's just one of those things that shows why Britain is so good at making these sci-fi shows. Now recently, I just re-watched Humans. Well, re is a bit of a stretch. It turns out I actually never even watched Series 3 in the first place, but now I have. Now Humans is a fantastic show. It's a really, really good example of modern sci-fi. It does something that I think is sort of very typical nowadays, especially at British sci-fi, and it really plays into this kind of modern day dystopia. We're not talking about a sort of nuclear holocaust or anything, we're talking about something that is an aspect of everyday life now, and they've taken it to sort of its logical extreme. Now the concept behind humans is basically taking what is effectively our voice assistants like Siri and Alexa, and really turning them into actual humans. Basically they become our sort of housekeepers and, I mean, effectively our slaves. However, this is kind of accepted in the world because they're just robots. That is until some of them start to develop their own conscious. Now this is because their creator sort of imbued a few prototypes with this sort of sentience, and then it spreads to others through coding and other kinds of things. What it really explores though in humans isn't necessarily this concept, but what it does instead is it explains what conscious is. There's a big debate as to whether this sort of, like, made conscious is real or not. Whether this sort of, the way that they experience stuff is the same as way, the way that we experience stuff, and whether they can be called humans, and whether they can have their own rights as we do. Now, as I touched upon, the major thing that makes humans so remarkable is that it's sort of relatability to the modern world. The synths, as they're called, the sort of robot slave effectively things, are basically sold in what look like Apple stores. They're very similar. This whole, the whole business that they have is very similar to Google, to Amazon, to Facebook and to Apple. It plays into a lot of our fears about artificial intelligence as to whether it could take over the world. And in fact, a lot of the story really focuses in on this. But what it does, once again, is really ground it. It makes it feel like this could be happening. And I think that that is a real example of why British sci-fi is so good at the moment. All right, now it's time for the elephant in the room. And that, of course, is Black Mirror. Now, Black Mirror is pretty much a masterpiece, I think. Charlie Brooker's show in each episode explores a different aspect of society in a very similar way to humans. It takes one core aspect of what happens in modern life and really sort of just stretches it to the absolute edges of its extreme possibilities. It does this in a number of different ways. For example, you've got the sort of Miley Cyrus story where it's kind of almost like generated uh, celebrity personas where they sort of almost come out of a factory. Then you've also got the key aspects like um, how virtual reality gaming, like where do you draw the lines of reality in those things, and a number of other aspects like how social media could rule the world effectively with its sort of rating systems, and how everything is so focused on the way that we see each other. Now I think Black Mirror is of course fantastic, and obviously I'm not gonna get any awards for pointing that out. Everyone knows that Black Mirror is basically a modern work of art. It holds, I mean, by its very nature, by its very description, it holds a sort of warped mirror up to society. That's what Black Mirror means. And it shows the sort of key flaws that, are, that there are in modern day society. Now, I think again, as I mentioned, this is what makes it fantastic sci-fi. It's not 
otherworldly. Like, no episodes of Black Mirror are set in outer space, with one in, one exception. However, this one exception isn't really set in outer space. I'm sure if you've watched it, you'll understand which episode I'm talking about. Now, really what makes Black Mirror fantastic is very different to what makes Doctor Who and Red Dwarf fantastic. It almost has a complete absence of heart, in a way. It's showing this sort of really sort of logical look at the world. And although there are a few episodes that do focus in on the heart of the human, it doesn't really sort of capture it as Red Dwarf and Doctor Who do. It does a lot of things similar as well, though, to things like Doctor Who, especially modern Who. There was the episode of um, Jodie Whittaker's run called Orphan 55, where it sort of explored a world that was sort of barren and where the indigenous life had been mutated. And it turns out that this was a heavily polluted future version of Earth. Now, again, this is a very similar core aspect as to what Black Mirror does really well, except it puts the Doctor Who over the top lens on that. It's a fantastic aspect of what I think makes a lot of modern sci-fi so remarkable. And it's done not just in British sci-fi as well, it's done all across the world. You've got stuff like Altered Carbon and many other shows just like it that really explore these kind of weird aspects of society that could be a possibility. And I know could be a possibility is a bit of a stretch, but I really do think that a lot of what makes these shows fantastic is the fact that they are almost grounded and they are almost believable despite the fact that they're so out there and odd. So there we go. That's my look on British sci-fi over the years and its evolution. Now of course there are some other fantastic examples of British sci-fi that I haven't mentioned, but if I was going to mention every single thing we'd be here for quite a while. Obviously some honourable mentions would be stuff like The Day of the Triffids, there's of course Thunderbirds, but I didn't really want to go into too many non-live action things because otherwise, like I say, I'd be here for quite a while. Of course, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to this channel if you're new around here so you don't miss any of my content. Also, please consider donating to my coffee page. We really want to keep this content going and if you donate even a small amount, all of that will help us keep this, these videos coming out. With all that being said, I'll see you next week for another video.